Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Summer is officially here and all across the state, Hoosiers are gearing up for fun at the fair. Elephant ears and Ferris wheels, showcases and competitions. Take a look back at some of our favorite fair moments. Journey to a Southern Indiana farm to see the start of prize winning art. Taste the sweetest fair treats made by the tiniest Hoosiers. Trace the history of Indiana agriculture through antique tractors and meet the animals of 4-H from big to small and even unexpected. Stay tuned for the stories that will make you feel like a kid once again. It's all coming up on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special, I'm Erica Sagone. This month, counties across Indiana will begin holding their annual fairs, all building up to a very special Bicentennial State Fair celebration. From art to agriculture, the fair showcases some of Indiana's greatest traditions. And for many exhibitors, preparations began many months ago. We used to grow watermelons, muskmelon, pumpkins. And I would add something every year. And my nephew, he brought two boxes of seeds home. And each box had a package of gourd seeds in them. I planted a row with those. And then the next year, I said, Ron, I'm gonna plant two rows. Then the next year, I wanted two acres and he would get mad every year because I was taking his land. <laughs> That's how it actually got started. Now, 30 years later, Ron and Helen Thomas continue to grow gourds on their 12-acre farm in Howard, Indiana. It's quite an experience watching stuff grow like that. Sometimes we've had these great big huge ones. Sometimes I take my friend out in the field, you know, our friends, and we just fall all over the place laughing at those great big things, how they have grown, you know, or the shape or size. So I was hooked just for those two packs of seeds. And then I sold, let's see, about $2,500 worth to one person. They saw my sign out there that I had gourds for sale. That chance encounter gave Helen her first glimpse at what could be done with gourd art. Once you see the end product of all that work you've done that you've really enjoyed and then you see that part and you get hooked, you know, it's like hunting mushrooms. You know, you see them in their sleep <laughs> and you don't mind it at all. The gourd is a fantastic medium to work on. You can do anything to a gourd that you can do to a piece of wood, any kind of craft or artwork, that type of thing. So it, it has really worked out you know, quite well for a lot of us to have got hooked on gourds. They talk to you. You can pick up a gourd and not know exactly what you want to do with it, but you can look at it and study it for a while. And one, one moment it'll go, oh, this is what I want you to do. So you know whether you're going to wood burn it or paint it or carve it or whatever. It, they just sort of have a life that they, they speak to you. Artists from all over Indiana get together for classes, festivals, and even competitions. The Indiana Gourd Society covers the entire state of Indiana. and We have about 350 members. Uh, we're getting ready to have our large state show in April. It's quite an interesting thing to see, and if you've never been to a gourd show, this is the one gourd show you need to come to. It's one of the largest in the United States. It's a satisfaction. It's a joy. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, you pick something up like this. Like me as a grower, I walk out there. You saw those old dirty things in the wagon. You look at those and you think, I wonder where it's going to end up. So, see, I'm not really in it for the money that that's an important part. But even if I wasn't making money, I'd still want to mess around with gourds. It's fun, it's fun, but it's my thing.
For more information on the Indiana Gourd Society, including upcoming events and competitions, visit indianagourdsociety.org. Well, like Helen, Hoosiers across the state love to share what they grow with fair visitors, often bringing the farm to the fair table. Beekeeping has been in my family for over 100 years, about 103. My grandfather started back in 1910. Then my mother started keeping bees. So since my family was in the beekeeping, I have memories of working in the bees, getting stung, not being able to go to school because my eyes were swelled shut. I remember extracting the honey, eating the honey raw out of the hive. Even to this day, when I walk into the honey house and smell the fresh honey, it still brings back memories working with my grandfather. And so it, it's, a, it's nice to be part of the family tradition and have those memories. I would say that beekeeping is an art, more than a science. When a person starts in beekeeping, they're very frightened, as most people would be, and they usually put on the entire suit and the veil and the gloves and the smoker, and they're very cautious. But I strongly recommend that a beekeeper, as they work in the bees, start moving slowly, listen to the bees, watch the bees, and maybe take off one glove, and then take off the other glove, and just slowly over time, get to the point where they can work with just the smoker, because when you do that, you are working with the bees. The more time you spend with them, the more you listen to them, you literally can, by the sound, by the pitch of the, their buzz, you can tell what type of mood that they're in. Or you can also tell what problems are in the hive just by the sound of it. You can also tell problems they're having by the smell of the hive. It is very difficult now to be a beekeeper financially because of the problems that we're having with the hives dying off. And so the more support we get, not only financially, but just people understanding that the bees need to be protected, that we need to minimize our use of pesticides and GMOs, things like that, then it's gonna help the beekeeper and help the honeybees out. Because since the honeybees do 80% of the insect pollination, they're very important for us to have around. And that's a big part of what we do, moving our hives to apples and to watermelons. And, and that's why we don't have very many hives actually on our farm, because they're out around the state. When you think of all the products that a beehive can produce, I find it fascinating of what I can make out of those products. So I started playing with beeswax lip balm and honey mustard and honey teriyaki. And then to see the eyes of the public when they also realize what you can make out of honey. And so I enjoy that contact with the, with the public, with the customer, introducing them to the wonderful world of honey. And they realize that honey is a wholesome product, that we basically extract it and put it in the jar and add a label. And that's pretty much all that we do. You don't have to wait until fair time to get a taste. Visit huntershoneyfarm.com to learn how you can visit their location all summer long. Indiana fairs are a great opportunity for Hoosiers to learn more about their community history. Let's look back at an organization working to preserve Indiana's agricultural legacy through machinery. Attention, all tractor owners has to register at the office here. All tractors needs to be registered. Thank you. It was sitting in a field down the road from my house and it had been sitting there for a couple of years. I kept bugging the guy about buying it and he finally, I had something he wanted and we did it, we traded. It wasn't in bad shape, it needed tires, it needed painted. It wasn't rusted, it was just kind of wore off and faded. I just like this style of tractor. It's kind of what you grew up with. I mean, if you're parents or grandparents had John Deere's or Alice Jammers, that's pretty much what you stuck with. I grew up on a dairy farm, but there wasn't any steam engines around or anything. My uh, uncle thrashed for us, but he had a 1530 International tractor. But uh, I've always been interested in old stuff. Our farm was bought off the government in 1832. And uh, when I got, well, in 1964, I think, I went to Rushville, Indiana, to a big steam show, and I, the bug bit me. <laughs> That's a 1906 Russell steam engine, traction engine. It's a steam tractor is what it is. 1906, it's, what's that, 100 and, 
Five years old. This asphalt we can do it there. <laughs> it's about tight enough. Yeah. The old guys are dying off and there's not as many kids are coming up. They don't know what happened back then. One time now. There's not as many steam engines left either. It's got a big whistle on it. And we'll blow the whistle. You can hear it for four or five miles around probably, that big one. Up on this hill you can. Mm -hmm. Green's all right, I guess. It's just, I don't like green. <laughs> Alice Chalmers just, I don't know, to me, it just seems like he's got more power. This is a 1919 advanced Rumley. The uh, tractor is a two-cylinder kerosene, but it's designed to run on kerosene or coal oil or almost diesel fuel or any kind of low-grade fuel you can put in it. The engineers in 1919 were pretty good. Being able to reverse engineer the tractor to, to repair it, to figure out what they've done, has been a blast. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. It's the engine. It's the process. What I enjoy is seeing an old engine run for the first time after 40 years. To hear it run for the first time, now that's a thrill. 50 years ago, everybody pretty much had a farm. Everybody lived in the country. Now it's flipped. Everybody's moving to city and urban areas, and there's a lot less farm, but there's, they're a lot bigger. It's a good organization. It's very important because it's, it's you know, American heritage. Learn how to attend the world's largest gas and engine tractor show. Visit tristategasengine-tractor.com for more information. While the Tri-State Tractor Show highlights Indiana's past, the 4-H Club is about nurturing Indiana's future. And each year, thousands of children raise livestock in a bid for a blue ribbon. Many of the animals can be found on a farm, but some might just surprise you. When you're trying to find a way to teach your kids responsibility and introduce them to farm life, you probably wouldn't think of the Shields family solution. I remember when they told me we were getting llamas, I wasn't sure what a llama was. I remember going to the farm and picking them out. And when I first told all my friends, they were kind of confused. They weren't exactly sure what they were either. And most of the time when I tell people I have llamas, they're like, oh, don't they spit? Don't they spit? And my answer is always, yes, they can, but they won't. And that's usually most of the reaction I get. Or people are like asking a million questions about them because they don't, they don't know much about them. And what exactly does one do with a llama? For Alex's mom, 4-H was a perfect place to start. It was something to do. It was something as a family um, that we all can be involved in. Um, you know, you have a sport and one can coach and one can play, but it involved everybody. And as soon as we got enrolled in 4-H, our local host farm, she was ready to get out. So that was my first big step. We became a host farm first year out. Shortly after, Karen became the new Llama Mama of the Sunrise Llama Club. Eleven years later, the 4-H group has grown leaps and bounds recruiting kids from local communities. With llamas, I never actually knew what a llama was until I moved here from Florida and just kind of fell in love with them when I saw my first llama and I showed her and decided that I couldn't get enough and I wanted to keep showing. It brings a lot of work ethic out in a lot of the kids. You know, they don't have to be athletic. You don't have to be in a sport. You just have to love your animal. And so I see a lot of that with the 4-H. Part of being a llama family that our kids do is they actually take ownership all year long. If you don't own a llama, you lease a llama. It's very cheap because we want to get in as many kids as we can. And we want all of our llamas to be used. They have a day throughout the week. They come and feed. It's also an opportunity to work with their animal if they need extra time. As older girls, we help with the younger ones, help them train, get familiar with an animal. A lot of it is teaching them how to take care of them, how to work with them. Well, it makes me feel good being able to teach them and to show them what the llamas can do. The world best thing they learn is patience because animals don't always do exactly what they want. So the kids have to learn patience. They have to learn, the llamas have to learn trust. And then they'll do anything. They all have their own personalities. They're like a cat or a dog as a pet. The more attention you put into them, the more you get out of them. 
you, you can see a bond and it's, it's, it's just amazing that they put so much time in. To inform the public, we'll take them down through the parades and you hear, oh my gosh, it's a camel. What is that thing? And then even when we're at the county fair, when people walk by and they ask a bunch of questions. My goal is always when people leave the llama barn that they know how sweet llamas are and that they would maybe want one in the future or they would always want to come back to the llama barn every year. That community outreach extends far beyond the fairgrounds, including using the llamas as therapy animals. Grizzly has one of the very few gentle personalities. He has never spit nor kicked at me in his life, which makes him perfect for the nursing home that we take him to. We use them as therapy llamas to encourage the residents to be more active. And with Grizzly, we trained him to go up elevators and up flights of stairs so that he can visit residents that are bedridden and that can't, can't come downstairs to see us and see what we're doing. He seems to understand the difference between People like you and I and the elderly or disabled, he's much more calm around them than he would with me. He'll let them pet wherever they want to. And he just, he loves them. He really loves them. And the llamas aren't just therapeutic for the community, they are life-changing for the members themselves. Being with llamas has definitely shaped my life. It has made me work for something. When you're in the ring, it's about you and how you've done with your animal. And so it helped me be dedicated. It really showed me how to have a passion for an animal, for, for anything. The kids are working hard to prepare for this year's competition season. Learn more at their Facebook page, Sunrise Llama Club. The llamas aren't the only unusual animals 4-H club members have a chance to raise. Our next subjects may be strange, but they are part of a tradition that stretches centuries. It's fair time in Indiana, and all around the state, 4-H'ers are showing off their favorite farm animals. Cows, horses, pigs, pigeons. Wait, pigeons? Why pigeons? Because most of the time you can have fun with them, you hold them a lot, they're warm. Yep, pigeons. And the Monroe County Pigeon Club sure does love them. From posters to hands-on pigeon care, these 4-H'ers spend their entire year building up to this very special day. Oh boy, that's a healthy bird too. What do you feed this bird? But you can't find a top-notch pigeon without having a top-notch pigeon judge. When I was really young, I wanted to be a bird. That's the honest truth. I'm 68. I've been doing it since I was 12. I've been judging actively for 20 years, probably. It was all about an interest that I had, something that my parents fostered in me. I had my pigeon loft out in the backyard. I'd go out there every morning before I went to school, even in high school, to be with my birds before I went to school. Chuck's expertise has led him all over the country judging national pigeon shows, but he says it's the county shows that remain closest to his heart. How many pigeons do you think I have at home? Anybody want to guess? Seven? How about 272? Yeah, yeah, that's what my wife says, oh, oh. It's all about whether the bird is representative of the breed or not. The height of the bird, the weight of the bird, how its feathers should be, how it should stand in the cage, all that kind of stuff. The coloring of the bird. I mean, you don't breed a championship bird overnight. You don't start out with two really great birds and put them together and get more great birds every time. And even though there can only be one winner, Chuck makes sure that the experience is more than just a competition. Now, you're probably wondering why I pick the birds up when I get them out. Why do I do that? See if they have mites. See if they have mites. That's good. That's good. What Here in Monroe County, it is a family. I pride myself in taking extra time with the kids. To me, it's all about education. It's all about developing relationships. I rarely go away from a show leaving a bad taste in folks' mouth. And I think that's extremely important, especially the kids. If the kid and I carry on a relationship and I come back the next year and the kid's happy, then I'm happy. I prefer 4-H over any other thing I've done with kids, including scouting, including youth sports, those kind of things. It's just amazingly more available for kids more growth involved with the kids. You never were out learning information about your pets. 
From Russian tumblers to racing homers, there are hundreds of breeds to learn about, which keeps a lifetime enthusiast like Chuck on his toes. The thing that makes it nice is that it's something that you have to do every day, and it keeps me very active. You learn to modify your personality so that you can get along with the birds. If they don't like you, they won't let you be in the loft with them. They will beat on you with their wings. They will fly away from you. They will not be around you. I don't think you probably know anybody that does pigeons besides me and these kids, but I'll do it till I die. I really will, you know, just because I enjoy it that much. Learn about 4-H clubs in your area, as well as a list of upcoming county fairs by visiting 4-h.purdue.edu. Nothing is more fun than strolling a fairway, listening to the sounds of Indiana musicians. Many of our past musical guests will perform around the state this summer, but the Shelby County Sinners will actually be performing at the State Fair. Let's take a listen. Well, the rich will take the money and the poor will fight it out. They'll divide up all the ashes once it's all burned to the ground. They'll dance and sing like a lunatics on the graves of those who paid the price it costs to believe in a dream that's gone away. They sold it to the enemy for an awful we could refuse. It's a knockdown drag. To fool you with all this smoking beer, stop filling up their pockets while you play to your fears. Well, it's hard to let you go by when it's something you can't use. It's a knockdown drag out, 21st century bail out blue. Change till you realize that all your dreams are too far out of range. And in your darkest hour, when all your fears come true, you'll find you spend your whole life caring those who didn't care for you. It's a fight to the finish, and someone's gone. Get a complete listing of events and exhibits at the State Fair at their website, indianastatefair.com. Well, that's all the time that we have for tonight. I hope that you're able to get out and enjoy your local fair this summer. Once again, before we go, the Shelby County Centers. Good night. Well, it's hard to concentrate on the road with the gun pointed at your head. It's been a long night of driving and I'm so damn tired But I don't want to end up dead Man, it's funny how things could be going so good But could change in the blink of an eye 300 miles to go Hope to God I can stay
stay alive Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 